Hey team, it's Tim from Racecraft here. Welcome to this week's members webinar. Today we're going to be talking all about the video VBOX system from RaceLogic. Before we get into that, let's get through a little bit of a pre-show first and like we always do, I'll give you guys a little bit of an update of what's been happening here around the shop. So just jumping over, over to my laptop screen here, I talked a little bit about this in the uh, last pre-show, one of the upgrades we've been doing to our SR86 powered, uh, sorry, SR powered GT86, which is a little endurance racing car, is moving the ignition coils from uh, being coil over plug to being a uh, sort of more conventional external single coil per plug. Uh, and this is uh, a modification here that we are using the rocker cover to mount the coil. So like most cars, there's a pretty big space premium that we've got. Um, in the car as far as trying to find space in the engine bay by the time you've got a large intake manifold you've got turbos uh, intercooler piping um, and it's not a particularly wide engine bay at the best of times it's certainly pretty tough to start finding places to mount everything certainly finding places where it's easy to get to things uh, making it easy to service them it makes it even tougher so what we ended up doing is uh, cutting down the rocker cover and mounting the coils on top. So this is um, last time I showed you guys a little bit earlier in the process. This is uh, just before Jimmy weld, uh, fabricator welded on this top plate. So here, basically in each one of these spots here, we've got one of the uh, sets of ignition coils being mounted. And then essentially you can connect the HT leads directly down on top uh, from each coil down onto each coil on plug, sort of sort of a, a coil on plug style, but with an HT lead in between. The idea here is that again, it just gives us a much more um, effective way of packaging everything in the engine bay, also making those new coils uh, a little bit more accessible to work on. We were having some, pre uh, some problems with the previous style of coil on plug coil, which is an R35 GTR style coil. We're hoping, and it certainly seems to be so far, that this new coil has solved some of our ignition problems. While we were at it, we also took the opportunity to move some of the engine breathers as well. So uh, you can see here, this is one, one of the old aftermarket breathers that we had. And actually, you can see it's a little bit out of focus here, but this was one of the original uh, breathers for the original SR20 engine. So what we did while we were there, we took the opportunity to sort of uh, clean up a little bit of that stuff. We essentially ended up deleting uh, this uh, breather here that was already blocked off but we took the opportunity just to sort of smooth it off to get rid of some of the clutter in there and now that we have uh, moved uh, sorry removed the top of this rocker cover here to put the ignition coils we took the opportunity to clean up uh, the two external breathers so before we had uh, this is one of the external breathers that went off to uh, the dry sump tank there and we had another one somewhere uh, in this region here on the on the other side here basically we took the opportunity to get rid of both of those and now we have mounted both of them one here and one here in the side here so that really just keeps it uh, much nicer so much more low profile solution everything sort of uh, sits much lower on the engine you don't have as many hoses up high where they can sort of have to sit around and can get tangled in the bonnet and stuff like that. So here is uh, the outcome of that solution. We don't quite have everything fitted in here. We can see we've got the injectors out of the engine at the moment. We've got this little rag sitting in there, but you can see uh, what I'm talking about with the, that's one of the breather hoses. This is just sitting here at the moment. It isn't actually connected up. That's why you can see so much thread in this area here, but you can see just slightly out of focus is the other one there. So you can see how those breather hoses sit uh, a lot nicer and a lot, more, a lot tidier in the engine bay. And this is what I was describing before about uh, the coils sitting on top. Uh, there we can see with these stumpy little plug leads. What we actually did is we got uh, sort of factory style SR20 uh, plug leads cut the ends off them and recrimped these 90 degree ends on there. The reason for that, and it's a little bit hard to see from this angle, but you can just make it out here, is it means that we keep the boots that sit down on top of the rock cover. That's uh, not always uh, an absolute necessary, but it is quite a nice thing if you end up with any fluid, any particularly water or anything there. If you go and steam clean the engine bay after being at a race event, it's really easy to end up with uh, water down those plug holes. And obviously if you have that, uh, you're always gonna have a shorting issue where the uh, that high tension voltage is gonna end up jumping through the water into the cylinder head rather than jumping across the plug gap. So it is actually quite a nice idea to be able to use OEM style plug leads where they have that nice seal to sit down hard on top of the rocker cover. I think it's a nice little uh, advantage we've got by going with the system. What else have we got going on here? Let's have a look. Sorry, let me jump across to this again. The other thing that's been going on is we've been continuing on with our ducting for our oil coolers. So we've had a couple of different iterations with this. Uh, this is the uh, latest um, sort of iteration that we're going through. So what we're actually looking at here, we're looking from the front right corner of the car. So this is uh, looking from the front right corner here. You can see that's the right front brake assembly. So just 
kind of a little bit hard to see with it being so dark here, but this is the outline of the transmission cooler. So that's uh, an air to oil cooler that we've got sitting in the right front corner of the car. This is the inlet duct here that uh, takes air from uh, the front sort of air dam of the bumper. And this is the outlet duct that the guys have been working on. So you can see it's actually got a little bit of a shape to it there where it actually, um, in this area here is where it is uh, clearing the wheel when it's all mounted there. So there's actually, it's a pretty tightly packaged space there between where the oil cooler is mounted uh, and the outlet duct and everything there to be able to squeeze between uh, the wheel while also being big enough to get the flow we need to um, evacuate the air out of the back of that oil cooler. So this one, what we're actually looking at here is actually a, uh, a tool or a foaming. So it's built out of foam and it's built up with uh, a bit of body filler on top to get everything smooth there. So that actually makes it a really nice smooth transition uh, to get the air out of that oil cooler and exa exhaust it in front of the, uh, in front of one of the front wheels there. And we've got the symmetrical thing. We've got uh, one on each side as well. So this is just the tool. This isn't the actual part, but this is the part, this is, this is the tool that we use to uh, make the part from. So what we're also going to have uh, eventually once they're permanently installed on the car is essentially a little gurney that sits on the front there. The idea behind that gurney is that uh, you end up creating a low pressure area behind that gurney and the advantage in cre creating that low pressure area there while you do end up adding a little bit of drag to the system by adding a gurney there, it, that low pressure area ends up helping to draw air out of the duct out here. So the idea here is at the Behind this face here, we've got low, a low pressure area that we've generated with the gurney with high dynamic, high dynamic pressure on the front of it. And it just helps to draw the air out. Essentially the whole thing with duct, anything with ducting or uh, heat exchangers in general, what we're looking to make is a pressure difference. We're looking to have a higher pressure on the front and a lower pressure on the back. When you, every, anytime you've got a pressure difference, that's what we need in order to be able to drive a flow through that cooler. And obviously when you're trying to maximize the cooling through a cooler, you want to maximize the airflow through it. Got a couple of other pictures of uh, the project there. This is uh, one of the ducts that's um, as the carbon is being laid on top of it. So the tool is made from just a really simple uh, sort of off-the-shelf foam material. Then it's covered in body filler to get the exact shape and all the dimensions we want. Then the guys go ahead and uh, make the real part out of carbon fiber. So this is when this is at the stage when the carbon is all just being laid up there on the tool, but you can see it's a relatively complex geometry going from the square shape around a bit of a corner here and then exiting out in front of the wheel. There's a fair bit going on there. This is one of the details. In fact, I'll come back to that in a second. I'll just show you. Uh, this is one of one of the uh, final parts. So again, you can see this is the area here where we connect to uh, the backside of, the, of each of the coolers. And that out here is the outlet where the air flows out in front of the wheel. You can see here there's uh, a couple of little features where this little tab sits on top of, uh, sort of slides on top of the cooler and uh, helps seal to the back of the cooler. And you've got uh, a little bit of foam tape here that's sealing to the top and the bottom of uh, the back of the cooler face. Now it's a little bit difficult to see but you can see a couple of little rivets here and this is one of the places we've got four points of this uh, around the uh, duct where this attaches to the actual oil cooler and that's what I want to come back and talk about here in this previous picture is we're using these little captured nuts these are really common you'll see these in uh, lots of motorsport applications essentially anytime you've got like a thin panel that needs to be attached to something now you could have uh, you could use use a simple nut on the back of this with a, a bolted nut uh, this is what we call a captured nut or a nut plate. This is something you'll see uh, all over the place in uh, lots of really high-end race cars. And the reason is because uh, it just makes it really convenient. It means you don't have to have a spanner or anything on the other side of that thin panel in order to be able to undo this thing. All you need to be able to do is get access to one side of it. And it means the nut is automatically held from the back. There's a certain, there's, sorry, there's another aspect of these that uh, makes them really nice. Is that You can't see it very clearly in this picture here, but that steel nut plate is actually slightly crimped over. And that's intentionally crimped to make that whole not completely round and that's intentional as it gives you essentially like a, a mechanical locking effect. So in the similar way to what you get with something like a nylock nut where you've got like a nylon sleeve inside the nut to stop that nut uh, coming loose due to vibration. It's a similar thing but it's essentially crimped down a very specific amount in order to stop the bolt uh, vibrating out. What that means is when you wind that bolt in, it's actually a little bit tougher to wind in. It means you can't actually wind them in by hand. They need to be wound in with a, a hex tool or something like that, depending on the style of the bolt that you're using. Um, but the idea being is it stops it vibrating loose. These are really, really widely used in the aviation industry. And over time, they've become uh, much more commonly used in the motorsport industry as a result. Obviously, there's a lot of similarities between aviation and motorsport as far as wanting uh, lightweight, high performance, uh, good serviceability and stuff like this. So you can get these nut plates in lots of different 
different styles. Uh, it's something that we use uh, quite extensively in our cars just because it does raise the level of convenience. Uh, they're also really easy to get hold of. Any sort of motorsport supply place will be able to uh, supply them whether you want Imperial or Metric or anything like that. Anyway, it's just a little detail I wanted to touch on because it is something we make quite a lot of use of in our cars and I do think it makes them uh, a little bit more serviceable as a result. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, looking at one of our most recent forum posts. So as normal, uh, we've had quite a bit of action on the forums with uh, lots of our members asking lots of really great questions. This one was from a wee while ago, but I thought it was a good question uh, that I should maybe bring up to talk about with everyone. So the, uh, the question here is about using toe strings when you're doing your own wheel alignment and a little bit about the height when you have, uh, how to set the height of those strings when you don't have an equal height wheel front and rear. So I'm just gonna uh, jump across the overhead here and sketch up exactly what I mean. So looking from uh, the overhead of the car, a lot of you guys that have already taken uh, wheel alignment, motorsport wheel alignment fundamentals course will already be familiar with this technique, but I'll just go through uh, a little bit how that works here. So if we're looking from top view here of the car and that's the front of the car, We've got each one of our wheels sticking up, sticking out at each corner of the car here. And when one of the techniques we use uh, as a reference to be able to set the toe angles of each of each corner of the car is to use a string-based wheel alignment setup. And this is used at all sorts of really, in uh, lots of really high-end racing. It sounds a bit basic, but it is very, very effective. It's also cheap and easy to transport around, so there's a lot of good reasons to be using it. But essentially the idea here is that you have a, a bar at the front and the rear of the car. And the idea behind these bars is that the, the really important thing about them is that they've got some form of slot or locating place for some string to go at each side of them. And the most important thing is that this distance here between these two slots or however you're gonna secure the strings, the imperative thing is that these two slots on the front and rear bars are the same distance apart. That's the most important thing. At that point, you know that if you're gonna run strings down between them like this, then you know because these are the same two distances apart, then you know that uh, you know that you've got these two strings parallel to each other. And that's really uh, one of the cruxes, one of the really most important things to understand about string wheel alignment based system. So after that, all you're doing is, uh, there's, a, there's more details here about how to center this on the car, but uh, long story short, all you're really doing is taking a measurement between uh, the front of the wheel and the string line and the rear of the wheel and the string line and the sort of, if there's any angle on that wheel, you're gonna get a difference in measurement front to back and that's gonna give you uh, your toe angle, which you can then calculate. Uh, well, sorry, you're gonna measure a toe distance and you can then go ahead and calculate a toe angle if you need to. But now that's the, uh, the overhead view, but it's really the side view that this forum uh, question's about. And that's thinking about uh, how we set the string height. So if we're looking at the ground plane there, and let's say we've got, um, in this particular case, the question is how to set these strings when you've got uh, two different uh, wheel or tire sizes that are really different from each other, which is definitely possible in some situations. I'm gonna really exaggerate it there just to make it really obvious. So what we normally do uh, when we set these strings up, so we're looking in the side view here, obviously, we were looking top view before, is that what we normally want to do is set the strings uh, parallel to the ground, but also uh, running through the center line of the wheels. The idea here by behind running through the center line of the wheels is that we can make our measurements front and rear, and as a result, we can uh, get an accurate toe measurement. Now the question here was, what if I've got really different size uh, wheels front and rear? So in this particular situation, uh, he was asking, uh, would, do we have the strings still parallel to the ground, or do I actually run the string lines? Because let me go a little bit further here. So we've got if we've got our ride height bars here and here, which is what we I was talking about at front and rear of the car. If we've got them sitting here and here. We've usually got the ability to, whether we're sitting these on jack stands or whether you've got a fixture to do this sort of a little bit more properly, you've got the ability to adjust the height of these up and down to get the string sitting in the right position for you. The question was whether you run the string through the center line of both, which would then mean the string would be uh, not parallel to the ground, or should you end up running it par parallel to the ground? Now the reality is with both of these setups, uh, it's, there's actually inaccuracies in both. It, um, but I think the best compromise, my, su my suggestion along that, was to still keep the string parallel to the, uh, to the ground, but run it at a height that's basically halfway between your two wheel positions. So I'll just draw a fresh one there to make that a little more obvious up here. So I would still, if this, are the, if this is the center point of both your wheels, I would essentially put the string line somewhere, so it's not a very good one, through there, something like that, in order to 
uh, essentially split the difference in your two wheel sizes. Unless the thing's really crazy and you're dealing with something like a tractor, then uh, even though you might have quite a big split between your front and rear tire sizes, it's still not going to be enough to uh, mess with your toe measurements too much. And it's probably more important to keep that toe reference line uh, parallel to the ground level. Certainly if you're running something like maybe like a 15 inch in the front and even a 17 inch in the rear, or maybe it's just really different tire sizes, uh, it's still not going to be enough to really cause a problem to your wheel alignment measurements as far as measuring your toe. So that, I thought that was a really good question from one of our members, James, and uh, that's how I basically just uh, told him that he, I thought well, he should deal with it, and you can go through and read some of the details in that post if you're interested into digging into that a little bit further as well. So guys, as always, we've always got more courses coming up. Uh, we've got our Race Driver Fundamentals course, which is slated for release very soon. We've also got a Suspension Fundamentals uh, webinar, sorry, Suspension Fundamentals course that's going to be coming out really soon. It's something I'm working on at the moment that we're in production for, which is really going to be a sort of a 101 on everything about suspension, everything from suspension kinematics, springs, dampers, anti-roll bars, uh, suspension geometry everything in there that's going to be a really packed full of really useful information for a lot of our racecraft members. So if you're interested in either of those courses, keep an eye out for what's going to be coming out soon. So guys, that's the end of the pre-show. I'll be back in a second and we will get right into the actual meat of today's webinar all about the V-Box. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.